I got questions again about the recording. You can share the Notion document with others. They will just not be able to edit it, um, but they can see the recording. So we're just not putting it on YouTube or anything for now. We're going to do that after uh, the series is over. But um, just wanted to bring that up again since I got asked uh, by a few of you. All right, so we have a packed schedule for the next hour and a half, so I'll get started. Um, today, we're going to have a longer presentation. Philippe is here to act as a conductor between what I think you would call how identity works in the real world and the disconnect between that and the software architectures that we build is going to be criticizing us. He will criticize my writing, the writing of other people in the room. That's what I asked him to do. So once again, um, I think that this kinds of uh, thoughtful dialogue is how ideas develop. So I ask everyone to make a sincere effort to be open and honest and fair. This means assuming good intentions of those you're in dialogue with, seeking clarity before reaching conclusions about their positions, and being open to changing your mind in light of good evidence. So, Philip, I'll turn it over to you. Um, if you could please give us a short overview of your trajectory and how it led you to work on questions of identity, and then present to us what you've prepared for today. Ah, uh, thanks, Paula. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, so, to that, first of all, I should just introduce myself. I'm an engineer by training, and I like to think of that in the 21st century variety of the engineer grappling with complex systems and perhaps solving some of the problems that 20th century engineers caused. Uh, so, I very much take a, a biomimetic ecological worldview, and I'm delighted to, to work in research at the, the Akasha Foundation. Let me share my screen and then I can dive straight in. There you go. I think that should be working a treat now. Swing that over there. Right. Uh, so thanks very much again for the opportunity. Uh, and thanks in advance for your attention. We're going to cover some interesting ground. Uh, and needless to say, you know, disclosure up front, uh, there's no way any one person has all the answers here, and I'm very much in that group. Uh, I do think I have some good questions at least, but as you'll see, the thesis here that is that in terms of trying to collectively find answers to the questions is going to be transdisciplinary. Now, I'm still practicing how to participate in these conversations because, well, they're deep and meaningful. So I am grateful to Paula's point for your patience and feedback. Uh, yeah, I, wherever I uh, focus in on anything that's already out there, so to speak, you know, if, I, if I'm critical of it, then I'm very much focused at the issue, at the argument rather than the argumenter. There's nothing ad hominem here. So, uh, where should I start? Akasha. Our purpose at the foundation is expressed in terms of expanding our collective minds at local, regional and global scales. And in working towards that, I don't know of any team that's been working for longer on the, the opportunities and challenges of, of Web3 social networking, for example, using the latest digital technologies to see how we might come together in organized more successfully than otherwise. And I don't know about you, I suspect as much, otherwise you wouldn't be doing what you're doing and you wouldn't be here today. No matter what I look at, no matter the problem or the wicked problem or the super wicked problem, it uh, doesn't matter which of the SDGs you might be thinking about. It doesn't matter how local your context or global identity inevitably lies at the beating heart of it. Uh, which is how I was drawn to it several years ago now, if only because I kept seeing it crop up and tease us and frustrate us, if I'm honest, as well as, you know, enable us in the same way that it has enabled us 
uh, as long as our species has been on the planet. But let's build up to the beautiful complexities of identity slowly. Let's start by reviewing the immediate purpose of the workshop series, stopping momentarily at a slide to try and situate the presentation. I like to think in terms of the internet ohm, and all I'm doing by adding the suffix ohm to internet there is to use the suffix associated with fields of biological study. So what happens if we look at this internet thing as a biological entity? Uh, ecology is a part of biology, so we can then think, in, think of an ecological approach, not merely technological. What do we mean by this? We mean that Alice is already a cyborg. She just doesn't use digital media and then, then put it down. You know, the, the, these things are our exobrains, our exoperipheral sensory system. The interweave of the digital and non-digital is such that you can't tease it apart anymore. Okay, so that's the, that's the context for this, this presentation. Now, there has been, if I'm fair to say, some community reluctance. By community, I mean the digital identity community to what I've been trying to communicate over the last, getting on for three years. Uh, there are occasional glimpses of people who support it. So Vlad Zamfir, some of you will know, uh, saw my 2019 critique and embraced it. So that's super. And I'm hoping that we can get some more people to understand the questions that I'm asking so that we can grapple with them collectively. So this workshop has a narrow context. You know, it's called the Internet of Humans, but the subtitle is Proof of Personhood. And it's nestled unavoidably within the wider context of identity. And for me, two questions capture the narrow context here. Is this, is this a person or software pretending to be? And is there one account, one person? And in fact, that second question has dominated, uh, or definitely dominated uh, Vitalik, um, Brian's contributions, Kevin's contributions in the last two workshops. Uh, if only because it's associated with solving some particular problems. But for me, uh, I'd rather not roll the two questions up into one, but keep them distinct. As we'll see later, there are contexts in which it's most valid to, to try and seek to answer only the first and ignore the second in some contexts. So uh, Vitalik went through uh, some of the goals last week. Brian touched on some of the goals. I like the way that they're described in the Who Watches the Watchman paper from 2020. But just to situate this presentation, I just point to, to four. Firstly, obviously, preventing bots from polluting the information ecology. Well, we have spoken a lot about enabling digital democracy whilst also maintaining anonymity or pseudonymity. We at Akasha are very interested in mechanisms that can resist the creep of poorly designed digital identity. Unfortunately, it's easier to design poorly than well in this context, or in fact, you could argue in any complex adaptive system. And finally, uh, we would like to pursue equality. Uh, this came up uh, in every presentation so far. Um, perhaps only Margaret went a little bit further in her description of relational equality. And she's actually touched on aspects of what I would call equity uh, and justice. So let me explain those a little bit more. In fact, let me use these, these cartoon representations as a way to explain it a little bit more. So answering those questions on the previous slide will move us from, will help move us from inequality to equality. But I would say that they don't help us progress further in terms of equity as it's shown here knowing that the little chap on the right needs to just climb a little bit higher to get to the fruit on the same tree. Or in fact, justice, where you start to recognize that, well, in this case, the tree representing the system needs a bit of fixing. And the explanation for why those questions on the previous slide get us to equality, but no further, is that those questions do not come with context included. They exclude context. You're not to know that the little chap has further to reach or that the tree is bent over. 
that doesn't come in direct answers to those two questions. So this slide prompts the question, should we need to prove personhood in pursuit of equality? Or should simply be, be being human suffice? And of course, like every question, that means we have to define our terms. What do we mean by human? Well, you could just say it's a member of the homo sapien species. I'm, I'm a member of that species, so I should be able to prove that I'm human. And I make this distinction on this slide because personhood appears to take us further semantically. It's the, the quality or condition of being an individual person. However, it's also socio-technical, sorry, socio-legal and socio-political in many of its contexts, in many of its connotations. So with those definitions in mind, I would say we'd only need to prove humanness, not personhood, in order to uh, pursue equality, as we saw on the previous slide. However, I'm going to, in a couple of slides, introduce different meanings of human and personhood, where the conclusion is 180 degree opposite. So yeah, all I can say is we can save ourselves a lot, a lot, a lot of time if we're all picking the same words and using them in the same way. The more time we spend on that up front, the more productive the conversation that will follow. Right, uh, to underline, no, where do I want to go next? I think I just want to emphasize that complexity again, because any aspect of identity is nothing less than all aspects of identity. We may be looking at proof of personhood or humanness, but it's difficult to do so without dragging everything else to do with identity with it. To that point, the heuristic or the design principle of separation of concerns doesn't always serve as well, and I'm going to get to that later. So what about that complexity? How can I present that in, in one slide? Well, it's hard. Um, the only way I could try to do it in one slide is like this. So identity is all of these. And yet every line on this slide seems to offer up a contradiction. There are characteristics of the complexities of identity that, that warrant maintaining multiple attempts to conceptualize it. There is a reason that we have multiple conceptualizations from different disciplines because of the seeming contradictions presented on this slide. So I guess the message when I was talking with, with Paula and Vinay last week about what we wanted to bring out in this session, one of the things that popped into my mind immediately was to make sure that whilst everybody on this call knows that identity is really complicated, I wanted to make sure that we understand that it's actually really, really, really complex and perhaps the ultimate complex closest to home, i.e. in our minds. On that note, many here will be familiar with Descartes saying cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Similarly, there's habiam corpus ergo sum, which actually means I have a body, therefore I am. And like many philosophers, John Locke grappled with the difference between these two, and he referred to the informational, the cogito ergo sum, as the person, and the physical, the habiam corpus, as the animal. His work fed into our understanding of, of law today, and perhaps most evidently with, for example, the age of majority, and with the defense of diminished responsibility, Locke determined that the person can vary, even if the associated animal body may be said in some way not to. And, and that by that I mean, uh, there's a field of philosophy called animalism, which means that uh, trying to tie me together to the chap born in the 70s 
involves some kind of link associated with the continuity of my body's living biological processes. So having said earlier that in one context, which was citizenship, that proof of human is more inclusive than proof of personhood, in this context, proof of person is in fact more flexible. You could argue more natural than proof of human animal, at least in this context and, and context matter. And paradoxically, information technologists, despite information being their thing, seem to have gravitated towards the physical as they try to encode identity. So that now switches it round. This means that on the previous slide with the pink chair, waiting for the bum to sit in it, we said human was more encompassing than person. And here we're saying person's more encompassing, more flexible, more in line with law than the human animal, the bodily. So you can see again how essential those terms are. I think I probably have banged that point home enough now. So allow me to move on to how I see computer science conceptualizing identity. And by cons consumer science, I mean, sorry, by computer science, yes, I mean uh, thinking about software, architecting software, encoding software. So to me, they have two major influences. Firstly, there's the law, and more broadly, the bureaucratization of society. Now, from my understanding, my amateur reading of the history of this, the bureaucratization of society set out to record births, record deaths, and keep some track in between for a comparatively small number of reasons. So for example, collecting taxes became quite an interesting thing for those in charge, as was forming an army when needed, keeping tabs on who owes who what and who promised what to whom when, and I guess, you know, punish deviance. So this is a major influence on the way we, as computer scientists, conceptualize identity. And of course, Computer science has a, an enormous heritage in addressing things. With the internet, it was about addressing computers. Then along came the World Wide Web, which is 30 today. Happy birthday, World Wide Web, um, which emerged to address documents. And then there was the Internet of Things, which I guess is in its second, well into its second decade now, which sought to bring in almost everything else except human identity, of course. Now, I guess what astonishes me, and I, and I, and I, and I try and use that word just genuinely um, rather than, than um, arrogantly, it, it astonishes me that some people in digital identity claim that they're building the missing identity layer. You know, it's as if the internet architects and the web architects kind of forgot that bit, and now they're sort of slotting it in, the missing human identity layer. Now, I think that's starkly reductive. I mean, if you, if, you, if you think about the fact that they perceive a layer that they could call the human identity layer in the tech stack, then that would be like calling uh, HTTP the conversation layer or the, the FOF ontology, the friend of a friend ontology, would be like calling that the human relations layer. It's just a, it's a step way over the mark for what can only be re rendered digitally. So I think that by themselves, these two influences have tragic consequences. And I guess the key phrase, of course, is, is, is by themselves. Because as far as I'm concerned, Bucky Fuller, was more in touch with how the world works than most computer scientists I interact with on the topic of digital identity. I'm not a thing, I'm, an, I'm not a noun. I seem to be a verb and in evolutionary process, an integral function of the universe. Uh, it's just, a, it, I seem to be a verb, just seems to be a, just a beautiful way to kind of describe the human condition, human community. So let me try and present identity in a way that will be unfamiliar, I think, to many of you. 
And you'll have to forgive my graphic design skills. I'm not a graphic designer. And boy, is it hard to pull together a slide stack that tries to do this justice, right? I mean, seriously. So I found myself with three circles, one for each of these. And I thought they're not separate. I want to show them as one. I put them all inside one circle and then it looked too uniform. So I spent a few minutes scribbling, right? I mean, that's my best attempt at conveying, you know, a ball of complexity. So whilst I'm trying to say that information relationships and identity are inseparable, let's frame each one in terms of the other. So firstly, life uses information to organize itself. Life is information, that's, that's the wonderful thing. It's the medium then for that life to organize. And in terms of common words in this field of digital identity, it's noteworthy that when we talk about attributes, we talk about credentials, they are information. And information is contextual to identities in relationships. And so context is information too. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, John Muir, if you're familiar with him, a renowned naturalist, a, a father of the national parks in the US, had this lovely phrase that said, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. And that's what I'm trying to convey in this particular diagram. Let's move to relationships. Now, ecologically speaking, relations relationships aren't some kind of triple that says Alice is married to Bob. Rather, it's far richer than that. They're the pathways for organizing. Um, they are responsible for the expansion of organizational identity. We're going through that process now. We are exchanging information. We're seeking common understanding through that information exchange. We're building up like ideas of the identity of the other people involved and assembling a collective identity, which we hope we can then train on being collectively intelligent and getting somewhere that we couldn't get individually. So that leaves identity as a sense-making capacity of organizing. It's how we go about sense-making and meaning-making. That's why identities exist as a cognitive function in our minds, which again, aren't in here, that's the brain in here, that our minds are information and therefore expand beyond our skull. And identities are, are narrative in nature, they're dynamic, they assemble in relationships that involve and produce interpersonal data, information. So a quick point on that interpersonal data. Just as I'm trying to distinguish here between natural conceptualizations of identity and say, for example, uh, legal conceptualization, personal data is a phrase that's for me, but only because it's a legal conceptualization. It doesn't reflect what we have in the real world. In ecologies, we don't have personal data. You can't spot it on a coral reef or in a rainforest uh, or in human society. Rather, we have interpersonal data. It's edge centric, and we'll, we'll revisit that later. Why? Because it's integral to identity, as we can see here from our ball of string, or whatever you want to call that thing. In short, then, Gregory Bateson, the great cyberneticist and anthropologist and polymath, basically said that relationships are imminent in information exchange. And we can extend that here to say that identities are imminent in the relationships imminent in information exchange. Such exchange is then modulated by identities, right? This is a continuous flux, ceaseless. It's a somatity, uh, which is a term that Gregory's daughter, Nora, um, has invented. It's a neologism describing a information exchange for mutual learning context. That's fundamentally what identity is. And if we value this dy dynamic, this, this complex at the beating heart of our topic here and the human species and human condition, then we can't apply the principle beloved by computer scientists of separation of concerns with abandon. It just doesn't work.
if we've got to check our principles and we've got to try again. So I guess I'm not, I'm not identifying deep challenges here just to be obstructive. Um, again, uh, an accusation that has come my way. Uh, fundamentally, I believe that the best system designs emerge from a deep understanding of the design constraints. If the system is to serve us humans, rather than have us humans serve the system. So let me just, I know we're, we're some way through the presentation now, so I just want to capture your attention again by making a, a stark assertion here that we live in a world where a packet of nuts has to carry the warning that it contains nuts, right? I mean, but if you go into any office of anybody working on digital identity, this should be on the wall, but it isn't. I'm going to read it verbatim because it has to go, you know, this has to be on record. Many millions of people have been excluded, persecuted and murdered with the assistance of prior identity architectures. And no other facet of information technology smashes into the human condition in quite the same way as digital identity. That's what we're, that's what we're grappling with, which is why I was so enthused by you know, Christopher's work with the Web of Trust, with Paula and, and Vinay trying to bring this, this workshop together because actually the other four are kind of, this is a little bit of a stereotype and a little bit unfair, but I'm gonna say they're kind of interested in the commercial opportunities. The example of the bureaucratic excellence of the Netherlands during World War, World War II is well known, but I will repeat it here for those who don't know it. As a proportion of the population, more Jews met their death who lived in the Netherlands during World War II than in Germany or Austria. Why? Because the Dutch were bloody good at their identity bureaucracy. Today, as we see Aadhaar uh, system in India, just running rampant, uh, uh, just a system for which the diligence in its design was so woefully lacking, I can't tell you. But today we're already starting to see, for example, it being wielded against Muslims. To design a system for inclusion is to design a system for exclusion. Etymologically, they have the same root, technologically they do too. So there are many conceptualizations of identity and our researcher Akasha has sought to categorize the conceptualization so that the design challenge may be communicated and shaped more effectively. So again, riffing off uh, our friend Buckminster Fuller, the way we want to help people in this design space is to take all of those multiple and varied conceptualizations of identity and categorize them as noun-like or verb-like. Let's just describe the difference just to, 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 to you know, drive it home. The noun-like are unchanging by design. A singular. There's only one of me in the eyes of the law, in the bureaucracy of the country I'm living in. I'm an object. You can point at me, you can prod me. Whereas in the verb-like conceptualizations, we're talking about something that's more dynamic, more multiple, more subtle, nuanced, and it's an informational form. The noun-like, historically at least, before the advent of, of pervasive digital services, were very occasional. I mean, when was the last time you had to show legal identity, proof of legal identity? Getting on a plane, buying an expensive financial product? You know, in... in uh, liberal democracies, we celebrate that fact because in those societies where the phrase papers please is uttered, that's, that's kind of a, a synonym for a police state. We don't want that. The verb-like identity, however, is every minute of every day. Uh, I would say every night as well, but I, I must do some research into how identities manifest in dreams. I haven't got that far yet. Um, the noun-like is fundamental to law, and therefore, you could argue, fundamental to finance, and it's fundamental to computer science. That's, as we explained earlier, 
uh, a major influence on the dominant conceptual conceptualization of identity in computer science. And what's alarming is despite coding society in the same way lawyers do, despite removing all the frictions associated with that code, unlike law, despite that code being insidious and operating whether you know about it or not, unlike law, that's what computer science is doing right now. Whereas every other discipline we care about is over there with the verb like. What's astonishing is it, 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 even economics. I mean, this is, this is the crazy thing. Economics has a reputation for being the most insular discipline, but even they got the religion of identity 20 years ago and behavioral economics has transformed, transformed the field. Um, there's a quote I've got in front of me here, camera 1999, here it says, economists routinely and proudly use models that are grossly inconsistent with findings from psychology. Akerlof and Cranton, 2000, said, the inclusion of identity substantively changes conclusions of previous economic analysis. Economists have got it, computer scientists haven't yet, we're the, we're the laggards. Now, is the computer science conceptualization valid? Yeah, of course it is, as much as any other. But to encode it as it's a panacea, to encode for it and no other conceptualization, to code for it and thereby frustrate the operation of the other conceptualizations is, in my humble opinion, unethical because it's deeply harmful. Self-sovereign identity has been presented as perhaps offering a way to be less noun-like. It doesn't. I'm going to touch on this um, in the coming slides. But the first thing to think about when you grapple with SSI is to ask, is the identifier verb-like or noun-like? To be verb-like, remember, it has to be imminent in the relationships, imminent, imminent in information exchange. Whereas noun like is something you can hang things off, point at, you can hang an attribute off it for something like that. And you have to ask yourself, we'll, we'll get to it, we'll get to SSI, but I'm going to dive into the, to the details associated with verifying credentials at the core of SSI first. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's, let's just dive into some of these. This is the bit where I'm, I'm gonna pick on aspects of some things this community has said and point out why that doesn't sit into the context here. If you can hear some background noise, I apologize. It's tipping down here. This is my first summer in the Netherlands. It's no better than London, I'm telling you. So here we have just two of the principles underpinning self-sovereign identity uh, originated by Christopher in 2016 still referred to a few months ago on Coindesk. The problem is that these are okay for noun-like conceptualizations of identity, but verb-like identity doesn't work like that. For blockchain networks to move from strictly providing financial services into enabling social and political applications, decentralized protocols for verifying unique human identities must be devised. This is who watches the watchman. Just make a slight change to that. It's into enabling some forms of social and political applications. Here we have uh, a paper by Imolika Jackson and, and Glenn Moyle. And the issue with that, of course, is that again, in an identity system for particular social orders and contexts we have in mind, not in an identity system period. It's very important. Here's a, a tweet uh, not too long ago, I guess 18 months ago from Vitalik. And here you can see that we're, we're thinking in terms of animalism. It's about a physical human being that we can poke, we can prod. We can objectify, and again, 
whilst you've got to con congratulate Vitalik for actually offering up a definition of identity when he brings it into a conversation, which so few people do, if I was just going to change one thing, if I was going to be really fussy, I'd have to say again, I'm going to define identity here for the applications I have in mind. We have to set out the context in order to not ignore the other contexts. Uh, here's a paper uh, from the Rad Exchange community. Uh, Matt, I know, is on the call. In the context I'm presenting here, I'd have to say that to put so much import on on chain identity, it feels wrong. It's not biomimetic. There's nothing in nature that I can think of that I've come across that I could find that says that 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 has any other ecology working like that. And when it comes to civil free blockchain environments, hallelujah, I get that that could contribute to some of the reasons we're gathered here in this workshop series. But if you're going to do it on a civil free blockchain environment, you've got to isolate that baby, because if it intermingles with other human systems in other contexts, you're going to get very poor outcomes. I guess I mentioned up front that my inspiration is biomimetic and, and learning from nature. And I'm reminded in this particular paper of a phrase that's attributed to Aristotle. If one way be better than another, that you may be sure is nature's way. Which I think is the perfect segue to a recent slide from Vitalik, which is, which is, um, yeah, so let's, let's, just, let's just dive in here. Building the attestation ecosystem. We should have more of it. And my question is, why? Why should we have more of it in Italy? Is that for trust or for bypassing it? And if you want to bypass the trust, which of the dimensions of trust are you looking at? I see that going from GDocs to PowerPoint reversed my arrow. That one should be pointing up, but hey, who's watching that closely? Um, you know, Institutional trustworthiness, this the paper I, I get the uh, three-dimensional approach from references uh, Professor Levy's work, and she spoke to institutional trustworthiness here. If you want an institution to bind, if you want that relational equality, if you want the trustworthiness, the legitimacy in these institutions, you can't bypass a major mechanism by which human relations and therefore identity are assembled. It gets a bit worse in as much as it says everything should be provable on chain. Brackets except voting, because that's one thing that Vitalik has really grappled beautifully with. I think if he grappled more with some other aspects of ecology, he would not show this slide. You want my religion provable on chain? You want my DNA provable on chain? Uh, to, to say that you want something to be provable, it, to say it should be provable is not the same as it will be provable. I'm going to get onto the fact that there are human beings involved here, not just technology. It's not the individual's choice. Give me a break. Structuration theory clearly, which is dominant in social science, clearly says that in a structure, whether or not I choose to prove my religion because it's on chain or prove my DNA because it's on chain, it's not a decision that I have. The structure insists on it in much the way that you can't live in India, really, practically today without having subscribed to the voluntary Aadhaar system. Then we have, this is a rich slide. <laughs> Then we have proof that I have a reputation score 100 plus according to metric X, but we're told that that's cool because zero knowledge proofs are involved. Z ZKPs offer technological privacy. There's no doubt about it. There isn't a mathematician on the planet has been able to break them. But in the socio-technology, this seeds the ground for the systemic evil of non-local, 
non-contextual reputation scoring. And I'm going to explain that in, in, in the coming slides. Now, one of the, the um, things I'm often asked for is, uh, or, or there's a fallback. If I, if, I, if I say something and someone says, well, it's OK, it's up to the, the, the individual. We just need to ask them for consent. If they withhold their consent, then that's that. But uh, it, it, consent, to rely architecturally on consent is arrogant and unethical because social scientists know that consent does not scale. Society today does not work on individual interaction by interaction, daily basis consent. It cannot scale. So I'm going to dive deeper into the emphasis of the technological and the neglect of the socio. Let's start with a, an easy example, which is a, a principle from privacy by design. Now I'm a guarded advocate of privacy by design with the emphasis on guarded. And I'm gonna ex try and explain one slide why, and then you can see the implications for the thesis here. So data minimization says that we will minimize the PII, the personally identifiable information that we're gonna collect. Okay, I like that, that sounds good. Surveillance, uh, capitalism is all about trying to collect as much of it as possible. So if we do the opposite and try and minimize it, the jobs are good. However, when you do that, the exchange of contextual information, in other words, characterizing the situation, is constrained. And if you do that, agency is constrained because social scientists have figured out we should ask them. We should invite them to the party, right? They've figured out that agency is partly contextual. So if you've removed the context, if you've minimized the context, you've minimized the agency. This is not the effect we're looking for, is it? Let's take us to a real world example here. Um, here's a, a mock-up of, of a UI. I'm applying for a job. I'm asked, could I you know, um, verify my graduate qualifications? You know, press the big button. Friction is removed. Jobs are good. And verifiable credential is established nanoseconds and the job's nearly mine. However, context is not included. Now, I would have graduated had my parents not died suddenly. Uh, just to be clear, my parents are alive and well, I'm just living a, a narrative here. That's the situation. And in that situation, I'm telling myself a story. This is my identity. I would have graduated had my parents not died suddenly. Now, with that narrative, I can go into the world, head held high, shoulders back, and I can go and get myself that job. However, in this situation, I cannot verify that I graduated because I did not graduate. And so my sub-narrative, my identity has changed. Not in the way that the inventors of the system ever imagined, of course. My self-narrative, having seen this UI, oh, and the one this afternoon, and then the one tomorrow morning, and then the one the afternoon after that, because I'm still applying for jobs, can't get beyond this stage. So my self-narrative, the system is telling me to update my self-narrative. I failed to graduate. I am a failure. So what's happening here and how might we explain it? Well, I'm going to look at triangles because triangles are to be found everywhere. There's a need for structural rigidity. That's the Eiffel Tower, uh, corrugated cardboard, the Manhattan Bridge, bicycle frames, you name it, where you need structural rigidity, engineers call on triangles. And what's interesting is the concept of trust triangles is integral to the set of protocols that constitute self-sovereign identity. That, that trust triangle predates digitalization, as we'll see in a few slides, but we're digitalizing it. We're taking questions of space out, geography, mass. We're just taking all the frictions right out. Here we have Bob on one vertex of the triangle, and he's the holder of a cryptographic proof. He got the proof, in this example, legal identity from an issuer, the government. Now, he can offer that proof to another party, the verifier, 
In this example, we have a bank and the bank therefore can verify Bob's ID as they're required to by law um, through the Know Your Customer KYC process. Any party can take any of these roles at any time, issuer, holder, verifier. So for example, in the SSI book, um, the next example is Bob wants to prove to a car dealer that he can afford to buy a car. Bang, the bank can say, here's a verifiable proof you've got the money in your account. Bob can tell the car dealer, I'm good for this. Excellent, verifiable credential in action. Notice how we have done two bureaucratic things there really easily. Uh, nothing about super, super wicked problems, collective intelligence, um, the global crisis we have with climate. This is, but this is cool. We can prove we're old enough to buy a beer and we can, we can open a bank account really easily. So Bob can also work with a car dealer. In nanosecond, the licensing agency has switched the ownership of the car from the car dealer to Bob. Now, Bob, actually, now got, he's got himself some wheels. He's, he's looking for some romance in his life, right? So um, now in my day, it was a question of boy meets girl, girl meets boy, and you kind of figure it out, right? But hey, now you've got to go to a dating agency. The dating site has got to check out who you are. Uh, can you show um, legal identity, please? And then Alice can be assured who Bob is before she meets Bob. Okay. Now... This is this is this is a load of triangles on one page. It gets tricky, at least for my graphic design skills, to start showing how these go on infinitely and how they occupy every quotidian action that you might be involved in, particularly as the position on the vertex that Bob holds at any point keeps changing. But you can just imagine that this is just triangles after triangles after triangles. Structural rigidity in this instance, is independent of privacy preservation. My thesis here is on information leakage in the digital domain. Let's just take another couple of slides on this. Here we have that situation we did with the mock-up of the UI. Bob's graduated from college. An employer wants to know that he's graduated. Trust triangle established. Nanosecond later, verifiable credentials. Uh, job offer on its way. Now, the situation we got through earlier where for some reason Bob just couldn't sit his finals in that finals week means that oh, he's not there, he's there. Yeah. In other words, Bob's context does not fit the systematized triangular potential. He's, if you like, off vertex. How dare he? I can't believe he's gone off vertex. We've got nothing for him there. We haven't got a verifiable credential that Bob would have graduated, except for the fact his both his parents died in finals week. That doesn't exist. So he's gone off vertex. Now you could say, in fact, Drummond Reed did say this to me. It's a very good, it's a very good point. Should the 99 the 999, should the 9,999 not benefit from this verifiable credential just because it didn't work for Bob? It's a good question. And one I said he should ask his ethics committee about. Because what's interesting is this is not a rarity. Well, it is, but only in the same way that rare diseases are. And do you know what? Rare diseases are surprisingly common. We will all find ourselves off vertex. Here's Bob. He's meeting Alice in the old fashioned way. They haven't done KYC on each other. Perhaps they just met at a bus stop, you know, something romantic and non digital. Right. And, and, and Bob, look, I've done this font as a slightly different color, right? Just to indicate that he's, he's on his best behavior. He's trying to project his best self as, as his, his self sovereign right, it has to be said. Now, at some point, there's another entity that comes into the mix and they're both involved in an exchange of credentials. That's fine. Maybe it's, it's Alice's employer and there's a job that she thinks Bob can apply for and therefore there's another entity that comes in with another triangle. Maybe that's the government ID. But Oh, hang on a minute. Now, now Bob's been triangulated. His legal ID has come back into the ecology. 
this needs further explanation because I can hear in my, you know, in my ear, SSI technologists saying, but it doesn't work like that. It doesn't, it doesn't leak the information. It's privacy preserving. Bob can be pink in his relationship with Alice and white in his relationship with the other parties in this, this triangle here. However, that's not the case. The yellow sides to the triangle are technological. The gap is sociological. The whole thing is the system in which we're actually interested in, the one that actually matters. It's socio-technological. To the technologist, I, and I've actually deliberately left gaps between the triangles on the slides to date, because to the technologist, that's, an, that's what they could call an air gap which is a technical term for effectively isolating something from the system in order that you know, inf digital, digitalized information can't jump the gap. However, let's just look at a bunch of people pre-digital and see how they build webs of trust. Again, I will apologize for my graphic design uh, capabilities. You're not, you're not tuned in today for my graphic design capabilities, let's face it. However, what I've tried to portray there is different colored lines because they're different contexts. They're a bit dotted, a bit haphazard. Some of them kind of make it all the way there and some stop short. But what's important is that the boxes are still people. They're innate connectors and sense makers. And the dotted lines are information exchange, which in the pre-digital context is slow, conversational and contextual. That space that the technologists look at and say, oh, that's an air gap, that's fine, no problem, is actually occupied by the most advanced, most intelligent life form we know of ourselves, right? I mean, that life form craves information that life form makes sense of that information by itself and socially, by its very design. It's how we've become the dominant species on the planet. It's more a superconductor than an air gap. Try to ask Alice and Bob to not move the information between triangles, especially when other people have designed software to enable them to do so really easily, right? So I'm gonna try and bring this presentation to a conclusion because you know, the conversation is really important uh, rather than just me in monologue here. So let me finish with a vista we've labeled generative identity. Before we get to that, here's one quote, one of my favorite quotes by a friend of all of ours, I think, Professor Nathan Schneider. We cannot accept technology as a substitute for taking the social, cultural and political considerations seriously. Decentralized technology does not guarantee de decentralized outcomes. Let's describe where I think we've come to if I have been able to affect productive information exchange and us building relationships in order to build identities and the collective identity. I think, I hope that a picture is forming in your minds and in our collective mind, right? I'm gonna re re read this verbatim. Cryptographic triangles emerge from the structure to establish new structure. Structure has a particular social science context here that I don't have time to go in for, but it's, it's, it's difficult to change it, I tell you. Uh, uh, this structure is unprecedented in terms of its rigidity and frictionless ability to get itself into the tiniest places. A fundamental, a fundamental process by which relationships are established and sustained Trust is bypass. We don't need it anymore. And by the way, when we say that that process is bypassed, identity is involved because relationships are involved, right? So we're undermining the ability for us to establish narrative identities in order to better make sense of the world. Ultimately, our agency is eroded, especially as and when we all find ourselves off vertex. So I can't come to any conclusion 
uh, other than to say that our research at the Akasha Foundation just calls for a transdisciplinary research and development. It's imperative. Um, no discipline can try and do this by themselves, especially the largely monodisciplinary community that calls itself the digital identity community at the moment. Now, at Akasha, we're really, really, really infused by the opportunities, which means we spend a lot of time trying to articulate the challenges here. That's why we've gone to this lens. We're, we're thinkers and we're doers, and we know that that thinking and the doing is most productive with a wide diversity of participants. In that spirit, I'll finish by describing an aspiration for the digitalization of human identity that we call generative identity. Uh, and I'll draw a comparison between what we hope generative identity vision will help us work towards versus where we think self-sovereign identity takes us when it's applied in the real world at scale. SSI is noun-like. It's an identifier applied to humans, even if they identify it to themselves. It's technological, it's about privacy and digital convenience, first and foremost. It's mechanistic and it's micro. It's scalable when you add up all the micros, but that's not quite the same thing as talking about it as macro. It treats identity as an object. Many people in the community actually talk in terms of owning your identity, which has flavors of the propertization of it, bringing in a legal concept where it doesn't, doesn't need to feature in any ecology. And because it objectifies identity, it objectifies relationships, and it effectively does all of that through the elimination of friction. Generative identity, on the other hand, is inspired by ecology. It's verb-like, it recognizes that we are inevitably talking some, about socio-technology here. It puts as its main goal, psychological, sociological, and ecological health, and not proving you're old enough to buy a beer at the bar. It's biomimetic. It says identity is information and emergent co-constitutional with interpersonal data and relationships. And aspects of ownership are just totally incongruous. And we recognize like all good engineers that friction is an important system of the property, is an important system property, not just something you get rid of. Uh, you know, we try and reduce the friction of cars so that they're more fuel efficient, but boy, do you want friction in play when you want to bring it to a halt safely, right? We may need to re-engineer some of the frictions we've taken out. I mentioned interpersonal data there. I said I would revisit it. Here I do so briefly here, if only because it's co-constitutive with identity. Personal identity only exists as a legal conceptualization. It's about data subjects. How dehumanizing is that? It's node-centric. It's very much tree-like. It invokes facsimile and it's done for privacy purposes. All well intended. I'm a qualified advocate of the GDPR in terms of us, in terms of pushing us forward, not in terms of being a final solution. Interpersonal data, on the other hand, is what you see in ecologies. It is nature. It's about humans and our augmentation. It's on the edge, just like identity. It's about our agency. It's more rhizomatic for those of you familiar with that philosophy versus the arboreal tree-like approach. It may involve caches, but not facsimiles, and it puts collective intelligence on a pedestal alongside privacy. I've put five principles out for generative identity. I'm not gonna linger on this slide much at all, but just to put them up here for something that we can revisit as and when we want to going forward. Um, some of them are really going against the grain of what computer scientists think they get out of bed for every morning. Uh, not least the fact that we are not going to end up with something that's universal. If it's generative, you can have generativity or you can have universal universality, but not both. And I think perhaps this slide will just put a period on the end of the presentation. I'm sure Paul is saying, time up, come on, you're rather running here. Here's the uh, trust triangles, the technology and the socio-technology gap. I think ultimately, if we can treat this as an ecology rather than a technology, 
that we might find ourselves with an abundant ecology. We might be able to wield these digital technologies to rise up to super wicked problems together. In fact, in the spirit of Buckminster Fuller, we might all readily, we might all more readily self-identify as astronauts on spaceship Earth. An outcome I don't believe we can get there with dominant approaches to digital identity today. Sorry for taking so long, Paula. Not at all. Thank you so much, Philip. I actually wanted to ask you, because I think this is really important, if you could go through your, uh, not the last slide, the one before that with the principles and just go through them really quickly. I think that would be really helpful and then we can uh, continue our conversation here. You did, you did ask me to do that last week and then I just did a really crafty thing of skipping through them really quickly and you're not letting me get away with it. Um, so I will. <laughs> Let's have a, a, a quick look at, just, at these. Yeah, I think it's super helpful. So the first principle is change, which will appear to appeal to Professor Levy, who last week talked about that as a quality of institutions. If institutions can't adapt to their context, they're no use to man or beast. Likewise, um, uh, in fact, I was in chatting to Nora Bateson a couple of weeks ago, and she just left me with a beautiful phrase, which is, ask yourself, what needs to change for the meadow to stay the same? If you start thinking about applying a protocol invented in one culture by a monodisciplinary bunch to 7 billion people, you might think that you're liberating Alice, uh, with your self-sovereign identity, but you're shackling it to it. Doesn't matter if her culture is different, she will be shackled, suffocated by the protocol you've inflicted on her. So she should have the ability to change it, just as we all should, as our generations come after us. Co-constitution, you'll have got that message by now, I hope. Uh, identity is not an isolated thing. It's not a noun, it's not something you can point out. It's an informational form that's imminent in relationships, which in turn are imminent in information exchange, which are in turn modulated by identities. It's a principle that's unavoidable if we want to build a healthy ecology. In an ecology, whether it's a, you know, a wetland, whether it's a coral reef, a forest, you'll find information flowing every which way, not just in the way that the cryptographic de device allows. So omnidirectionality is a principle. Friction, I can't help but think, although I'm desperate to meet other disciplines and, and, and build this conversation out so we can explore other ways to do this. But at the moment, the only way I can think of it is if removing all the friction is part of the problem that leads, leads to dystopian outcomes, then somehow we have to engineer it back in. I can't put it any other way than that. And I think I just I did touch on number five briefly as I concluded the stack, which is, you won't find one bioregion identical to another bioregion. You won't find a bioregion you can draw an exact boundary around. There's no bioregion that's self-sovereign. There's no individual that's self-sovereign. There's no community that's self-sovereign. The informational flux can lend itself in some designs, depending on your context and your agenda, to having a border drawn at some point. But that doesn't change the ecology, that just helps you communicate what you're thinking and pursue the goals that you would like to see manifest in the world. We can't have universality. We can't have that boundary drawing done by an elite few applied to 7 billion people plus. So non-universality is a key principle. Does that work, Paula? Excellent, thank you so much, Billy. Um, well, right now we should just take a deep breath. This was a really long uh, presentation, but I thought it was an important one. Um, so just for us to have a, a, a bit of a break, uh, let's go to our police exercise. I'm pasting the link in the chat. And then I would like to ask you to add statements for the next 10 minutes. 
And that will not leave us a lot of time for discussion. So for those of you who can and want to, you're welcome to stay for another half hour. And uh, for those of you who, who can't, of course, uh, that's perfectly understandable. But yeah, let's take uh, 10 minutes for to add a few statements to, to our police conversation. And of course, if you're done adding statements, you can always uh, just start liking, disliking, or passing everybody else's statements. I'll give you two more minutes so that we can have a short discussion afterwards. All right, um, everyone, please come back to the Zoom room. Um, and now I would love to hear 
uh, if any of you have any immediate reactions, responses to this presentation that you would like to offer the group? Uh, well, I just, uh, if you if you allow, wanted to thank uh, Philip a lot. I, I really think this is super important issue. Uh, this is super important questions, and I ask those questions a lot to myself. And I, I, I don't have enough knowledge to even think about it. So now I have a little more knowledge to put everything on shelves, and we'll keep. Uh, <laughs> I hope we'll keep uh, um, building this on. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. Much appreciated. Anyone else? Um, so I think Ted had a question about eliminating fiction. Uh, he asked, he was asking if you can expand on that. Maybe you can articulate it better, Ted. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the reason with, I'm oh, sorry, please, if you, I just jump straight in there, please. No, no, you're completely good. I was just, I was just hoping to find uh, an example of a way that eliminating eliminating friction might um, cause harm in identity systems. Obviously, we love digitalization. We're obsessed with digitalization because it uh, works without the frictions of mass uh, or space or or even time. I mean, it doesn't eliminate time but it compresses time incredibly um, and so when you remove the frictions you can allow information to move a lot faster so we have evolved as a species the most adept species that we know of for moving information around absorbing it communicating it trying to make sense of it individually trying to make sense of it collectively we have evolved in a situation where information comes at us so fast. And that fast is incredibly, incredibly slow compared to the fast of a completely digitalized identity system that involves the transmission of, for example, verifiable credentials. So when you remove the friction, suddenly this, the thing that I call the superconductor is overwhelmed and can do nothing but pass it on. The sense-making capacity is reduced because of information overload. And so actually you just become a conductor rather than a sense maker. And the system decides rather than you individually. Now this is going into domains of psychology and social science that I'm not qualified to speak about. Um, I think in describing this talk, Paula uh, put in the email that I described myself as a, a conductor, not, not as in a conductor, but as, in, in conducting, like a heat conductor, electrical conductor, bringing in stuff I've read in those other disciplines that were on the verb like slide um, and trying to channel those into this conversation as a representative in proxy for them not being here in the room. Um, so to me, the wonders and the dystopian outcomes of rendering a system friction free are plain to see. Am I very good at explaining that yet? Yeah. No, because I'm still learning. I, I'm still learning how to explain it. I have another way to, to add to that, Philip. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we go back even before Fuller and, you know, Fuller oft, often used these terms in cybernetics, you know, to control any system. Um, you know, you need not just amplifiers, you also need attenuators, um, whether or not that's a, a mechanical system, a, uh, a electrical system, or, um, you know, anything that is systemic in fashion. So what we have is lots and lots of things that amplify, you know, amplify news, amplify attention, amplify, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there hasn't been a balance of those things that allow for attenuation. Um, uh, you know, when you have, an, uh, when you have a, a, a system with too much amplification, the machine eventually explodes, you know, it's the bridge that, that sways and cracks, uh, that type of stuff. You know, you need things that also 
bring it all into balance. And I think that that's maybe another way of uh, expressing sort of this problem is that, you know, we need to look at does things have to be that fast? You know, do, you know, shouldn't there be ways to solve things, uh, you know, other than just by amplification? It's, it's beautifully put, the cyberneticists, especially at the Macy conferences in the 1950s, nailed that. Um, what's, and and I'm, I'm being an engineer, I'm, you know, a part-time cyberneticist, um, control system freak, but I know from dipping into all of those other disciplines that they can say it in their way that corresponds to what Christopher's just said, which relates to their verb-like conceptualization of identity that is not represented in, in, in the system. When I, when I spoke to a psychologist a few weeks ago and explained the friction-free nature of the um, wide-scale uptake of, of protocols developed in the name of SSI, um, she just said, "Oh, how funny!" That it, it was just a, it was just a, a, a just a. I thought well, I'm going to have to remember that because it was just the way she said it. it. Was like, wow, how can anybody think that that would work for psychological health? I also think one one of the most interesting concepts of. Uh, Philip's presentation to me is this idea of being off vertex. I hope this is uh, an expression that we start using more because it, I think that it really helps encapsulate, you know, the difficulty and, and, and his point on kind of how all of us are going to be off vertex. This is not a, a, a rarity, uh, but something that should that should be happening to all of us. And, and this is one of the main, I think, uh, harmful consequences of having a frictionless system. You can't, you lose all of the context that um, that is helpful in when when people are off vertex. I'd say that is it. Um, Peter, please. You're muted. Thanks, thanks. Uh, I wanted to raise the question, uh, what's our next step now? <laughs> Uh, so now, now that we understand the problems, so I, I guess one thing I, I can imagine is start watching what how we talk about it in public. Another uh, ex another thing uh, Divya mentioned, uh, separating identity and identifi identification could be a good start. And so my question to everyone here: What else? What what can we do right now? What our next step? It's, it's a fantastic question. I think that's the agenda for Vinay and, and Paula in bringing this together. I know it's Christopher's agenda with the Web of Trust work, um, which is I'm a big fan of. Could, and I know because we've spoken about it, we know it could be more multidisciplinary, but how do you get the disciplines in the room to, to exchange their insights? Uh, Margaret and Vitalik were talking and Oh, I feel bad calling Margaret now, Professor Levy. And, uh, and Vitalik were talking about, you know, the fact that they're trying to come at the same problem space from completely different disciplinary perspectives and struggling because there's no common language. So to me, this em emphasis on being pedantic, dare I say, almost academic about bringing out these, these, this, this terminology and getting sufficiently fluid fluent in a in, even in an amateur way which is all i am in these other disciplines i'm a technologist right so uh you just have to dip in and and, and learn it so peter i would definitely put some great story and some educational materials that we can co-develop to co-teach i'm 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 in that same boat there's a whole bunch of wonderful stuff on on you know that um uh you know, has not been integrated uh, here, whether or not it's, you know, Ostrom's work and things. Uh, but, you know, but also things of, you know, we, we talk about being human, there is sort of the shadow side of human, which is apes and tribes and, and, um, you know, all of those aspects of being human, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, signaling for, for, you know, collaboration, could all, can also be a signal for collaboration to do harm <laughs> to someone else. Uh, 
when we create a shared language, like, you know, proof of personhood as a term or self-sovereign identity as a term, we're isolating ourselves from other people who don't use that other language, which, um, you know, but also brings people together because we're all in this group. So you have this kind of weird thing where we're isolating ourselves by creating common languages and shared languages and whatever, um, uh, but we're also bringing you know, ourselves together that way too. So there are risks in all of that. That, that is the ball of string, as I call it. That is, that's identity. That's us trying to make big sense-making as a collective. Um, you've just, I think you've just described my hour's presentation in 30 seconds, Christopher, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to nudge some of the practitioners in the room. So uh, Ugo, Federico, Adam, like, do you, do you have any uh, reactions to this presentation or thoughts to offer to us? All right. Um, I don't, well, have, I don't have any immediate reaction I, I need to, to rub my head around it and maybe we are used um from the let me put the video <laughs> um maybe we're more, more used um to think about the um, i guess identity from the perspective of computer science when we were designing proof of humanity um there's for sure all the loss of um, context so I, I need to learn more but but sounds like a, a, they mentioned that is worth adding, but as you know, we need to see how to add this into systems that were designed maybe in some in a different way. I think all of us here get our kicks from working in a complex domain. So the good news is it's even more complex than perhaps we thought, and therefore even more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to, to learn more about the good job. Brian, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I, I wanted to discuss something, but I, I see we're running out of time and I think it might be, a, I, I kind of wanted to come back to that, the identity versus personhood topic that uh, Philip, you addressed, especially earlier on your talk, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, it'll, it'll fit in the re remaining time. So I, I could come back to it at a different meeting. I'd, I'd like that. Um, one comment I did make at the time, which I would just like to see, is I couldn't work out in my head whether by the definitions I presented, a broad proof of human, in terms of the context that was on the slide with the pink chair, as in a member of the species, um, was in its way a human identity thing, because identity either in the sim simplest terms as everyone here will know when I say it says I'm like these people and I'm unlike those people um, mm. a difference that makes a difference and uh, or in this instance brings us together in, into a into a collective which is distinct from other collectives um, in that instance all we're saying is that Alice is one of the species like one of all of us um, and therefore the only thing we're saying is she's not a bot and yeah. Uh, so I can work out if that's actually an identity. I, yeah. you know, in, in a way, it is, and in a way, it's meaningless as an identity. But um, so perhaps if there is a separation of concerns to be done, it would be at the species level. Yeah. Can I? Can I actually? Can I propose a couple thought, a quick thought experiments that I, that you know I I feel might be interesting anyway. So. One is, uh, do you remember the classic New Yorker cartoon with, uh, with two dogs browsing the internet, one of them saying, hey, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? Now, suppose, you know, those two dogs actually existed and like, you know, dogs had been, you know, some dogs have been uplifted and, you know, can actually browse the, the, the internet and talk to each other. But of course, they're very discriminated against and they really don't want to be known to be dogs, right? Um, would, uh, would, are, would they be people, you know, by, by, by this definition, right? They're, you know, I'm, I'm supposing that they, ha they are, have proved themselves intelligent and capable of browsing the network and browsing the web and, you know, and making that comment. 
let's say, right? So, but they are obviously not human, right? Uh, um, so, so, you know, the, you know, this is a very hypothetical example, but, it, but it's not. Well, it's not that. As you know, of course, it's not that hypothetical. Because it's yeah. a very short leap. Sorry to interrupt, but tell me if I'm not yeah. going to take this the right way. No, it's a very short, short leap from there to thinking about Alice having an agent that works on her behalf. Yeah. And as I said on the second slide in the entire stack, in terms of the internet home treating this digital mesh as a biological field of study, um, we're talking about the assemblage of Alice with her yeah. tools. Um, in different combinations, in different contexts, at different times of the day. And therefore, to a certain extent, part of her, and it is her in the digital age, is still processing over here while she's over here with a different assemblage in a different context, which actually yeah. means she's in two places or two contexts at once because she's now a cyborg. And that's a relevant yeah. thing to be. We should be looking to make the most of that capability, not trying to sort of shut it down. Yes. So the so the the thing is, what well, one of the key issues is, uh, I, I believe, you know, that that we're trying to get at when, uh, you know, at least in in motivating proof of personhood systems, is the question of dependence or independence, right? You know. Uh, so yeah, you know, Alice can have many identities. She can have, you know, uh, she she can have. Um, um, uh, you know, a bot assistant or something like that to, to think of a, 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 but if, if all of them are controlled by the same entity are, you know, kind of representing the same entity, you know, we're, we're thinking of those as a Sybil attack, right? You know, if, if Alice is using many of those to cast many votes, for example, we're, you know, typically thinking of that as a Sybil attack that, you know, uh, that is a, you know, bad thing we would like to avoid. On the other hand, you know, Alice merely using diff many different accounts to reflect different parts of her personality, or you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, is a total, you know, is a is a very different thing, you know, that uh, especially as privacy people would like to would like to support, right? Uh, so, but. You know, you know, making that example more extreme as a second thought experiment, imagine a Borg, a Borg collective, right? You know, uh, you know, 10,000 people in a big cubicle spaceship, but all slave to one consciousness. Does a Borg collective, should a Borg collective get one vote or 10,000 in, uh, in a proof of personhood system? Given Akasha's purpose being expressed in terms of helping collective intelligence to emerge in both its forms. In other words, we each individually exhibit an intelligence we wouldn't otherwise unless we were part of a collective and the collective itself exhibiting an intelligence you can't attribute to any of the members. We're very interested in, in the long term, this hasn't got really practical ramifications in 2021, it has to be said, but in the, in the long term, uh, we are very keen to understand how that collective intelligence might emerge. And it's not that it could in some governance systems in some governance systems it could be said to be better than democracy now i say that by looking at uh, organizational de design the best organizations are not run democratically they run sociocratically with respect for human agency and participation in context um, the sociocratic approaches are very well documented and they're still a work in progress and they're experimenting I don't think from a societal perspective, we can say, guys, 2020s, democracy's done, we're gonna go sociocratic over here. However, 2040s, 2050s, 2060s, there may be some aspect of sociocracy, which is not a technocracy, it's not a plutocracy. It's just playing to each of our strengths as part of a collective mind in the context in which that participant finds themselves at the time. So, but that's, that's that we've got some bigger problems to solve before we get there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're coming to the official end of our workshop. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here. Thank you so much, Philip, for this incredible presentation. Whoever wants uh, is more than welcome to stay for another half an hour so we can uh, continue this discussion for a bit. I'm sure there's a lot to talk about and to unpack there. Um, so yeah, just wanted to, to signal the official end.
Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience as I struggle to communicate some ideas that are quite complex and that I still don't fully understand. So thank you. Of course, that was fascinating, Philip. Um, all right, uh, anyone has any additional questions, responses, reactions? Well, I had a, I had a question for Philip. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that happened, you know, I, I put those principles out five years ago uh, in hope that they would be revised. Um, they were just my, you know, first throwing out of things. Um, but, you know, as you've stated, they've kind of become enshrined by a certain community, which I call the legally enabled self-sovereign community, which I consider to be very much a subset. So, you know, lately I've been moving to, um, you know, what I've been calling the trust minimized side, like how do we protect the vulnerable, you know, focus, not on everybody, not, a, not on a global personhood or anything else like that, but, you know, focus on specific vulnerable populations and their specific needs, um, you know, unique to them. Um, uh, you know, what can we do? I mean, do we need to add, you know, verbs and, you know, in a context to all of the old self-sovereign terms? Do we need a, you know, um, you know, for me, the generative one, it, you know, has some interesting points, but it's not, doesn't feel as complete. Um, you know, how, how do we go as a community to, to uh, influence not just the less identity fee people who may be creating the next idealistic Dutch, uh, you know, a catastrophe, uh, you know, for when the Dutch get vote, you know, vote in a tyrant or something. Um, uh, you know, any thoughts there? Uh, well, I'm with forward. you. I, I'm with you when it comes to less the L E S S legally. Uh, the legal obsession it, it, it just seems to just go against the grain of what I I think you stand for. You know, your identity, in my eyes, is being done a disservice by people who are running with less. Um, and I can see from your recent Coindesk article that that's kind of how you see it as, as well. Um, the interesting... The, I wonder whether our obsession with membership, whether that's explicit membership, I am... Uh, I'm not, by the way, but just an example. I am a Bitcoin maximalist, you know, therefore um, I'm a member of this. And to your point, Christopher, being a member of a vulnerable group. We don't think of membership of a vulnerable group in the same way as we think of membership of Liverpool FC. Um, perhaps if only because it seems, and I'm riffing as I'm going here, that <laughs> one is a personal choice, a consequence of agency, and the other one is a consequence of circumstances. And to my point earlier where you can't just draw a boundary around a community and say whether one is a member or not, which was to Vitalik's point, whether we're overplaying the idea of community as it is. Um, I personally, and again to Vitalik's point, would like to bring in experts externally who are not members of the group. Well, what does that actually mean? We're, we're, we're corralling their their minds and their context. So how are they not a member? This, this idea of membership is bureaucratic. And when the bureaucracy was, I know I'm going for a tangent a little bit here, but when the bureaucracy was first instantiated, at least in, in its modern form, that was a huge breakthrough that everybody celebrated. I mean, the bureaucracy that we now look at and go, oh, that's very bureaucratic. That was enabling agentic, fascinating innovation in society. Um, so I, I, I I, I, I sense where what you're talking about. I'm struggling to find the common language because no one's really painted the picture of the problem space that you've just described in explicit terms that we can just point at in the same way, for example, we've got 17 SDG goals and everybody can point at. So to me, perhaps part of the challenge we have here is with, a, with the richest transdisciplinary understanding of identity that we can assemble, can we, in some way, after the definition of terms, begin to uh, 
identified like similar to SDGs, major goals that we would like to see uh, us achieve with identity in a way that I don't think has been done in a verb-like way in the community to date. I was rambling then a little bit. I don't know if I answered your question directly. I don't think I did, sorry. Oh, good. Matt? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be at risk of uh, stumbling and rambling a bit here too, but I think that's- <laughs> It's a common answer. identity, welcome. <laughs> welcome yeah. to membership. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm just, I just think I was, um, well, I, I, I wanted to say that, I mean, I think that the, the just, I mean, the distinction between sort of like positivistic formalized identities and the, and the verb-like identity is, I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you on that, just, just, to, just to put that out there. The, um, um, and so, you know, but I think that there's, there's actually, you know, our, 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 our real identity, like what we really are, I think is inarticulable. And um, and you actually can't do anything with it, like literally. Um, and um, that's uh, that's nonetheless it's nonetheless important to remember that that's the case, right? Can I ask you to, yeah. to define what you mean by real identity. Well, our subjectivity, our consciousness, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and, it's, and it's singular in yes. your conceptualization of it. Okay. Um, and well, it's uh, also the ship of Theseus problem. Yeah, we're, uh, ship of Theseus is a is an angle on it, I guess. Um, but well, well, what I'm trying to say here is that is that in some of these systems which are trying to do a positivistic thing, which is inherently inconsistent with the recognition of that of that other thing, of that uh, you know I am a verb thing. The uh, I agree with what you say that it's important to be. It's 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 central. It's really important and a really good idea to be always extremely clear about what the sort of purpose of the positivistic system we're building is. So, like, what is the context for which we're building a system, right? Um, uh, what you know, we're, we're reducing something. We're we're taking an irreducible thing. We're reducing it. And why are we doing that? What are we doing it for? Um, and uh, to me, that which I don't always. I'm not always. Your talk is a great reminder for me to be more explicit about what I'm reducing for, why I'm reducing something, and um, uh, and so that's great. That's a great reminder. Thank you for that. First of all, and second of all, um, uh, I think my answer to it, you know, to the I, I try to be as unreductive as possible. You know, I mean, I think that's an ideal. Nonetheless, anybody who builds systems is reducing. And the thing that I'm reducing for usually is it, it, in identity systems is democracy. I'm trying to make it possible for, for an attractive conception of democratic, per, democratic participation, democratic control over systems to happen. Um, and um, uh, and then, then of course- I have a quick question. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Can I ask, can you say, what is it that Okay, if you can drop the word democratic, yeah. What does that mean? What does what are you? Are, are, you, are you asking for a fair system? Are you asking for a balanced system? Are you asking us for a system that doesn't have bad outcomes? I mean, what is democratic to you? Because I think that's one of the fundamental flaws. We abbreviate this deep context of democratic, um, and it doesn't. You know, if you, there are lots of good mathematical arguments that show that that uh 50 means 100 percent uh, disagreement um yeah so <laughs> well but so i think i feel like you're asking me to abbreviate democratic actually when i don't i don't want to that's why i, I want to keep i want to use the word because what, what i what i mean by the word can't be can't be reduced in that way like i i have a rich conception of democracy which is to say i think the definition of it is contestable um and uh and that it uh demands interpretation and involves and in, in my interpretation you know involves all kinds of 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 things all kinds of other values which are themselves objects of interpretation like like equality and participation and dignity things like that 
Yeah, so I have a question for you, Christopher. Um, so what is the, like, if, you know, democracy has all these inherent flaws, um, if we have something that is like a common resource, let's say, um, let's say that, uh, um, you know, who gets to, who gets to govern um, the planet, for instance, like the, you know, the fate of the natural resources of the earth. Um, if we can't figure out a way to be like, you know, try to be democratic about that, like who, who gets to govern that by default then? Um, like what's the default? And so, um, well, yeah, that, so I mean, that's kind there of actually how I, are some, there are some answers for that. And again, I'm challenged because I, you know, we keep on using this term democratic, which is great. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, you know, I would love to have it be this big thing that I call a deep context, which has a lot of depth and whatever. Unfortunately, others, in particular po politics and, and social media, whatever, reduce it to meaning 50 percent, uh, 50 plus one or whatever, you know, that the common voting. So there are some, you know, studies, some mathematical results and, and other things that show if you uh, can reverse the results, meaning, you know, the decision you made can be unmade in the future. Um, uh, and some other criteria, which I'm forgetting off the top of my head, then a 50% vote is fine. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, in many cases, if it's reversible, if it's, uh, if it is for a smaller group of people, and most of the costs are borne by that smaller group of people, it shouldn't even require 50%. You know, a minority can do something if it only say taxes themselves or, or whatever. Uh, they don't, shouldn't need permission. But then if it affects a lot of people or is gonna have a very long-term uh, consequence, um, then it needs much higher. It needs super majorities or even, you know, various forms of consensus. I have a, a blog post on called the spectrum of consent. So if you just search alacrity spectrum consent, um, I've got like 30 different kinds of group decision making processes in there. Uh, and um, uh, but anyhow, you need one of the greater ones. So this is part of the reason why, for instance, the Bitcoin ecosystem decided uh, to go for 95% for one of their decisions. For other decisions, uh, you know, uh, a uh, uh, you know, moving just from a plurality to a true majority, meaning of actual everybody involved, not the majority of people voting, um, is sufficient. So there's you know a huge range there, and and we don't have a good uh, cultural understanding that you know all of these are potentially valuable in different contexts, which is back to my thing. We keep on losing our context. We keep, <laughs> um, so we keep on forgetting the little asterisks on all of our deep context words like democracy. Well, right, I right. think beyond a different, discussing different uh, models of governance, what I think Matt is trying to get at here, and Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is just kind of this tension between uh, the need to create or the benefits that you can get when you're creating participatory systems online, which need to rely on some form of unique uh, personhood and this conception of a verb-like identity, which is not as reductive. Is that, was that what you were getting to, Matt? Um, yeah, I mean, in a sense that I, I, I think that it, it's, um, uh, well, I mean, what I'm getting at is that, you know, it, I, and again, there's, there's every, so, I mean, every time I say the word democracy, I, I have an asterisk by it. I mean, I mean, a deep conception of it, right? The, uh, I don't, I don't mean like a cartoon, you know, 51% democracy or something. The, um, you know, w w when I, um, w when I think about uh, you know, what, what these systems, could, what, what, what am I trying to say? What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I think that democracy, asterisk, is the friction that I'd like to see in the system, basically, right? I, I mean, I'd like to see these, these kinds of big decisions made in, in a 
democratic asterisk way. And um, um, uh, it seems to me that, um, you know, we, we need to, there, there's something to be said. I mean, there's obviously a thousand and one ways that it can go terribly wrong, but there's something to be said. I mean, for that as a uh, goal of of identity systems. I, that's basically all. That's basically. All. I, I think that context is 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 undeniable. At the top of towards the top of the presentation, where I yeah. posited that perhaps we're dealing with two questions. One is is this. Uh, is this a person or some a software pretending to be? Uh, the second question is, in this system, is it one account, one person? And I think so long as we can design systems that can answer both of those questions and not suffocate the contexts where you only want to answer the first, then that's not a bad thing. If an identity system leaves you uh, with no symbols, then you may have democracy, but you haven't got your psychological freedoms anymore. Um, your contextual freedoms it is it is uh, you're anything but self-sovereign in that instance um so and then the challenge with any ecology is that our species has a fabulous track record for solving for one part of the ecology only to completely if i'm speaking frankly fuck it up i mean we we we're very good at applying reduction solutions to a part of the ecology to the despair of, of the other qualities and characteristics of that ecology. And we can't afford to do that with, with digital identity. So if we are going to go for a civil resistance, it, then we have to, there are, there are times when we need a separation of concerns. We need to separate that. We need to air gap that from other systems so that you don't infect the entire internet home uh, with, with, civil resistance, because that's that's just plainly nothing that a psychologist or a sociologist would ever say is healthy. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Philip, just to add, just to, I think it's a development of what you're getting at here. And I, th I think it's something that I, you and I totally agree about is, which is that like, for example, if we build an identity system that has as its criterion, uh, making sure that uh, people over 21, you know, people under 21 can't buy beer or something like that, right? Then, then that that system might might uh, distort, you know, other every you know everything else, right? It it it, it could be. So to to me, that use case comes a long, long, long second place to any aspiration to transdisciplinarily pursue psychological, sociological, and ecological health. Yeah. Um, so. No, so that's my point. So, I mean, you know, if, if we make a system that, you know, that, 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 that frictionlessly pursues some, some stupid limited gain, uh, goal like that, right, then we, uh, we flatten everything else in the service yeah. of that. That's beautifully put, flattened it. I like that. That's a nice metaphor. Uh, yeah, so, oh, I, um, I mean, I wrote it out there, but I'll just say what I, I'll just say it, say what I wrote, but, um, yeah, I mean, the reason why, to me, like the most important, um, you know, uh, reason to be in this, uh, like caring about unique, unique humanness is because there's, there appear to be, like, from my perspective, there appear to be um, all these things that, uh, that kind of like belong to us as humanity, whether it's the, you know, the the knowledge that we've built up um, or whether it's uh, these natural resources where you you like you feel like everyone sh should have a chance to participate and so that is like that's exactly what got me into thinking about unique identity it's like okay well how do you how do you do that um and so yeah it doesn't like democracy is like uh, loaded with all this other stuff so it doesn't have to be democracy but it just has to be like participation like human participation there are there are like subjects or i guess you could say objects of um like our human collective uh attention or mind that 
uh, that we can address those objects. Um, but we can't address them if our global brain is like operating at 1% or something. We, we want to like up that to, to get as close to 100% as we can. And, and uh, you know, because I mean, do you guys agree that there's like this big, like these, these objects or subjects, like these, these almost universal things that, uh, that humanity should be or can be looking at together? Uh, definitely. And institutionally, the way that our shared culture has chosen to address that is democratically. Um, and whilst we might sense superior ways beyond democracy, um, building on the values that democracy delivers rather than having the arrogance to pretend that those values no longer apply, just in case anybody's interpreting what I'm saying here as other systems that have been tried and tested and suck even more than democracy. <laughs> um, I feel like there's things in the future we haven't yet had the facility to work with yet or wield because we've not had the insight or the systems to enable that at scale. Um, and that's tantalizing. The challenge, of course, is that to get there, we've, well, that's, that's actually, I think I've just described the journey more than the destination. Um, and we've got um, some very much more pragmatic things to address this decade. So plus one, Adam, to your emphasis on democratic participation, part, participation so long as it does not exclude civils in all other non-democratic contexts or not immediately democratic contexts. I mean, I can imagine, for example, that in a community, everyone can have multiple identities. However, when you wanna take a democratic vote or, or sound people out democratically or engage in a democratic process, only some of those accounts may do so and the other ones are not because they are civils and that's fine. Um, no one needs to know which are which, and you can get the psychological health and the democratic benefits, so long as the system is designed well. Um, but I still haven't quite worked out how that system might be designed. <laughs> which is why we're in this workshop, and yeah, we need that's why we're here. Join us. Um, yeah, I think that your kind of your corrections of the quotes that many of us, uh, the sentences that many of us wrote. Uh, I think we're kind of summarize what, what's really the, the mistake, which is that sometimes we talk about uh, identity or civil resistance or even zero knowledge proof in these universal ways. And we really have to be kind of aware that these are not uh, end all solutions and that they do solve for an important uh, problem, but not that they shouldn't, we should be very much more careful in our language uh, in the way that we speak about it. Uh, because they don't solve for anything and for everything and they can have pretty serious consequences. So I think this was really a great learning opportunity for all of us. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other comments. I have a question. I was looking at the, pol yeah. uh, the polis polls and I see this mm -hmm. one, it's number 16 and it kind of captured my attention because I, I'm not sure. Um, so I voted against it, and ninety percent of the people voted for it. And I'm not sure. It, so it's a, it's broken into two parts, which might be slightly confusing. Um, it's so it's got like a a statement and then like a recommendation, which is actually what the polis said to do. It said, um, "What are unintended harms and possible ways to prevent them?" So most of them I there just wasn't I room. I asked people to separate. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, because there wasn't enough room, but this one like actually managed to squish okay. like two things into one. Um, and so it's hard to like tell what people were agreeing with, but this one says um, technology solutions need human intervention. And then the second part says establish a decentralized network of human adjudicators who are, ra who are randomly allocated edge cases. So like to me, I, d I agree with the first part but then I disagree with the second part, so I disagree with it. Um, but I'm curious about you all, if you answered that one, and if you did, do you, do you really think that there should be um, 
uh, a decentralized network of human adjudicators who are randomly allocated edge cases? And if so, like, how are you imagining that might work? That's well, so you, I mean, I think you, you have to look at the history. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff around the term sortition. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm not saying that the, the this, that second statement um, is, you know, necessarily correct. But, um, you know, once you get to a certain scale, um, uh, you know, sortition sometimes is a good answer. Uh, you know, it solves some problems in California um, by having a much more representative system to, uh, you know, in effect, a jury type of thing of peers, um, uh, you know, can, can, can do some things that a very large group of people can have you know, difficult challenges with because of large group uh, processes and large group uh, uh, challenges. So I'm not saying sortition is the answer to everything, but it is certainly the a good answer for many things. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that gives me a good insight on why, why that but is, might why be did you better than that? the alternatives, I guess. Well, why did you disagree? Sorry, go ahead. Nick. Well, I disagreed because I it was unclear to me like how okay, so so my fear is that um when you get a random sampling of people to decide something, especially like tricky edge cases, that um uh like they're not gonna be qualified. So um like I look in uh you know um and, and it's not just the fact that they're random, it's the fact that, uh, I mean, it's not it's not in sortition that, that that might fail. It's like other things that would fail too. So if um, if you tried just a broad democracy with a majority vote or something like that, um, it would also probably fail similarly because it, uh, like people just don't, if it's a tricky edge case, most people are just not going to know the answer or not have a, you know something useful to contribute there. In fact, a jury of your peers, whilst being yeah, right. a of, of, of our legal process, yep. is being replaced in some instances by judge-led inquiries because the matter is so complex that they don't believe a jury of your peers can could grapple with it. And complex financial fraud cases, for example, is yeah. the first, I believe. Well, the, the classic Athenian sortition, they actually segregated the people so it was this weird computer in Athens, like, you know, a 2,000, you know, 2,500 year old computer that would randomly select people uh, from 10 tribes in proportion to the size of those tribes. And then they were segregated for a year. Okay. So they had the ability to do that particular function that the sortition group was allowed to do um, only because they did not have to, to feed themselves. They didn't have to do all of their other duties. They were paid to do it. So it's a lot more like a grand jury, which exists for, you know, six months or, or longer than it, than a, you know, oh, a snap decision of 12 random people. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. So, and you're um, expected to you know, spend that the, time doing copious research and, and appealing to yeah. experts and, you know, and, you know, there'll still be people in there who will decide, well, I'm not going to do that research and I'm going to, you know, do what, you know, my uh, uh, silverback gorilla uh, said to do, but it'll be more representative of, of the group. So. Um... Yeah, thank you. Thank you for fleshing that out. That's really what I needed, because I think trying to sometimes trying to cram statements into uh, whatever the limit is, 100 140 characters is just impossible. So I needed someone to like expand that for me. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I wish there was some way. There was this thing called IBIS from a decade ago, which actually allowed those statements to be modified over time and improved over time. And then, I mean, I, every time I see one of these, I go, that's good, but they didn't quite get it. And you know, is that going to be the question in the next session? I don't know. I mean, it's Notion's cool because it, you know, quickly shows some some uh, asymmetries of the group um but you know it's not very so far do you have any suggestions i wonder if there is an uh modern day ibis 
Um, I'll have to look. Um, you know, okay, I mean, yeah. the, the, yeah. Um, another thing, Adam, that I know many proponents of certition argue is that um, people have to, they go through an educational process once they are sorted out. So by doing that, you're actually spreading more kind of civics knowledge throughout the population since you have like representatives, like people who are sorted from within many different communities, then they're all kind of getting educated about the legislative process or about how to be a jury. Um, so this kind of spreads mm -hmm. uh, more evenly that knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So my, my only personal experience with anything um, similar to this is being um, drafted for a jury and being in a room with a bunch of people. It was, it was actually like a, um, a domestic violence case that we were drafted to um, listen to, but, uh, but I was in the pre-selection process and most of the people there, um, it seemed like their goal was to um, try to convince the lawyers that they wouldn't be good <laughs> to be on the jury so that they could go back to work. And so that that's that's been my only experience. But I can imagine like that like I can imagine it uh sortition working well for cert, for solving certain problems. And like you said, I mean that's that sounds I that sounds like a great goal to spread the knowledge, spread the the learning, the responsibility. Uh, I think that's I mean, those are those are really good goals. It's just it's just funny to see in practice that it was like that was the furthest thing from people's minds. It's like, how do I spend the least amount of time on this that I possibly can and get back to work? Well, there's also this this aspect that systems evolve to try to maladapt these things. So, you know, these days, you know, the defense lawyer's goal is to get one person on the jury who will say, I don't want to make a decision or I want to, I'm going to make it not get guilty. They only have to get one person on, on, on the table. Um, so that's, that's all they focus on, which means the defense in reaction to that particular strategy is uh, to, to basically prevent there being one person who can't you know, make a decision and that's really hard to do. <laughs> but, you know, systems, you know, that what, you know, you know, uh, evolve uh, and systems evolve around it. So like sortition, whatever system you come with, you know, needs to, to not be static because, you know, somebody will figure out how to game the system and you need to be able to constantly evolve the system against adversaries who are going to try to find ways to abuse the system. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a verb to... <laughs> I have to go to. Yeah, I like um, it. I like it. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This was really mm -hmm. fascinating. So much fun for me, at least. Um, and uh, and so enriching. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Philippe, for your incredible presentation. Thank and, you, Philip. Uh, hopefully, this can all result in really good work. I think that one of the main outcomes of today was some of the suggestions about what we can do next as a group so hopefully we'll, we'll see. see if if we've killed the attendees to the next one you need to find me <laughs> <laughs> yes I okay ciao take care bye-bye